Yeah. Uh, so the next thing we have up on the agenda this afternoon is uh, this panel on IPv4 and just number of resources in general transfers uh, specific to the Aaron region since that's where we're at today. And so we have uh, a really good panel here of, of some industry experts and uh, I'll introduce them one by one. We're going to do some opening remarks and then dive in and hopefully you all have some questions and, and, uh, and feedback and we'll want to make this as interactive as possible as we get going here. So uh, first up is John Curran, we've already uh, introduced, and he's going to talk about uh, the transfer market in the Aaron region specifically, again from the Aaron perspective. Uh, thank you, Chris. I'll try to be uh, pretty quick going through these. Um, talk about uh, IPv4 transfers going on, uh, sort of what's motivating them. Uh, we'll talk about inter-RIR transfers. Uh, we'll talk about legacy resources. So. Yeah, you can't quite see it in that font, but those are the completed IPv4 address space transfers in the Aaron region. This is from someone in the Aaron region to someone else. Uh, we have a policy in the NRPM, the Network Resource Policy Manual, section 8.3. Um, and you can see there's actually some sizable blocks in there. There's a few 12s and, and uh, 13s. Um, and this has been growing. Uh, you can go online, this list is updated online. Uh, whenever, whenever we, uh, actually monthly, we update and post this. We don't approve all the transfers. Some people want to do a transfer and they come to us and they say, we've agreed we're going to sell our uh, interest to another party and that's wonderful, great. Uh, but unfortunately, um, we have to abide by the, the community developed policy. Uh, the U.S. government uh, has us run the internet according to multi-stakeholder principles, which means we set these policies according to the community. The community establishes policies. These policies are used in administration of the registry in the region. And if you try to do a transfer and they don't meet the principles that were set by the community, then it doesn't get transferred. Um, and um, so, yeah, if you try to transfer to someone who doesn't need the addresses, currently the transfer policy states you have to need the addresses. You have to show that you'll use them in a 24 month period. You can't transfer more than that. Requests to transfer blocks by other than the actual registrant. You'd think this wouldn't happen, but occasionally someone comes up and says, yeah, I'm transferring uh, this address block to uh, Mr. Smith over here, but Mr. Jones actually wasn't the guy it's registered to. Sometimes it's just because the records haven't been updated. Companies are acquisitions. There's a lot of things going on. There's there's record keeping that isn't always maintained and needs to be updated. Sometimes it's because someone's getting very creative with someone else's address block. We have to go through and work that out. Um, request to transfer address block sizes smaller than the minimum. If you try to transfer an IP address, like a slash 32 to another party, you'll get turned down. Um, we've had this happen, we've had a court um, that wanted to do that. We had to go explain, I'm sorry, we're not breaking up address blocks. That is in the middle of an ISP's block and it actually isn't owned by the customer, it's just on loan to him as part of service. Um, we get involved in these. And then requests to transfer blocks larger than needed. Obviously if someone only has justification within two years for slash 20, you can't transfer slash 18. Uh, you can go find a few other folks to get the remainder and transfer. Inter-RIR transfers. There's a policy that uh, allows inter-RIR transfer to uh, another recipient in another region, as long as that other RIR has a compatible policy. Um, and uh, we have had success with that, and there's been a number of transfers to the APNIC region. This is also updated monthly online. Um, RIPE region. We don't presently have a compatible policy with the RIPE region. Um, but that might change, and then it might change again. <laughs> so let's talk about that briefly. There's a policy proposal that will be discussed in Dublin next month. Uh, which if adopted would be a compatible needs pol uh, compatible needs based policy just like we have with the APNIC region. And it would allow open up and allow transfers to and from parties between the RIPE region and the Aaron region and vice versa. Um, there's also a policy proposal being considered at the same time. They're cleaning up because they're at depletion. They no longer need a lot of um, the needs assessment language in their policy manual. And so they're cleaning it up. Uh, that's what's being proposed. That needs assessment language is used as part of the transfers. Um, 
If it is removed, then suddenly transfers are allowed between any two parties without any, uh, even if uh, the recipient doesn't need the addresses, that would make it incompatible. So depending on which of these <laughs> pass, we may or may not have uh, later on this uh, spring or early summer, we may have a compatible transfer policy to and from the ripe region. Completed AS transfers, autonomous system numbers actually can be transferred. Uh, we have the policy allows that, and uh, we've had a small number of them. Um, and there, a lot of them are cleanup. In fact, in a lot of cases, this is a case where you have organizations who have, over time, separated or moved, or uh, you know, a government agency might be letting a, a small college use uh, an AS number or an address block. It's very hard for them to say they. They, uh, they can't really update the records conveniently. With a transfer policy, they can say, yeah, we transferred it. One dollar will update the records. It makes it um, uh, something that sh uh, makes for better record upkeeping. Um, we don't have inter-RIR AS transfers. On the left, you can see there, there is a policy proposal in discussion, which will be discussed next week, 2013-1, uh, which would allow inter-RIR transfers of AS numbers. I don't know if there's a lot of demand for that. We, we don't have a lot of demand for AS transfers, but we had seven of them happen. Um, people, some people are saying this is sort of a completeness. It should be allowed if it's not forbidden. Some people are saying if someone doesn't need a policy, why would you add more text to the policy manual? So you can sort of look at that either way. At the end of the day, Aaron will implement whatever the folks decide is the right thing there. Um, transfer facilitators. Um, so sometimes you need help doing transfers, and it's because you either need to find a matching party. You've got addresses and you need someone who wants them or you want addresses and you gotta find someone who has them. Uh, sometimes it's just help working through the process. If, you're, if your job is uh, you know, running a business and not dealing with addresses day in and day out, then someone to facilitate this can be helpful. We have a list of registered transfer facilitators um, and uh, those organizations, uh, no iron policies have agreed to them. Uh, we have a listing service that they can make use of uh, to post addresses available or people who need addresses. We've had that need verified by Aaron. Um, and that's updated again on the facilitator list online. Um, legacy resources. This comes up. Um, so one of the things that happens is that people go to transfer addresses and uh, we say those addresses are in the Aaron region. They're subject to Aaron's policies. We've had people assert otherwise. And um, some of this has gone to court, um, but it's never gone to court with a definitive outcome. It's gone to court and either on procedural mechanisms or because of the nature of how, for example, bankruptcies work, it's been resolved. Uh, Aaron's never been directed to do any updates to the registry contrary to our community policy. Very proud to say that. Uh, having noted such, um, people look and say, I got my addresses before Aaron was formed. How can Aaron policies be binding upon me? I got them before you were here. In fact, uh, the National Science Foundation General Counsel issued a letter to an organization saying that they were unaware of any way that uh, these policies could be applicable. Um, and that created a little bit of concern. Uh, and uh, as it turns out, Aaron responded to that. And uh, shortly thereafter, the NSF General Counsel sent a letter saying that these were beliefs and observations and not any statement of US government policy. Um, all the letters are there. You can find the URLs. They're also on our website. You can go look. Um, the, Dep the Department of Commerce, NTIA, actually sent out a list of principles for uh, how uh, number resource management uh, should be done per NTIA, which is the lead agency in managing internet number resources. And they indicated that they're supportive of Aaron and the policies that the community forms through the multi-stakeholder process. So um, we continue to operate the registry according to the community policy. This applies to all resources, including legacy resources. Um, and uh, so if you're a legacy holder, you probably want to keep that in mind because we don't see a difference one way or the other. Um, and you can go find the references if you want to go look them up. Um, that's my introduction to transfers in the Aaron region, and uh, I'll turn it back over to Chris. Thanks, John. Um, next up, I want to have Charles Lee come uh, 
give his opening remarks. Um, and uh, let me just do this. You don't have any slides, right? No. Okay, Charles Lee, the uh, president of Adrax. How you doing? Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, welcome the opportunity. Um, I don't have a prepared slide deck. Um, there were some discussions about what would be discussed up here. Again, I would encourage you to make this a dialogue and not a series of monologues. Um, the more you get from this, the better use of the time, and that's what this is all about. So would encourage as much dialogue as possible. Um, I've got a few points to make. First of all, um, IPv4 exhaustion. Language, language is important. Um, IPv4 is not exhausted. It's not even tired. It's, it's alive and well. And the question is not, is, is it IPv6 or IPv4? It is IPv6 and IPv4. The question is for how long? And everyone in here will have a different answer. But there is, there is a period of time which we have entered here which assures us that V4 and V6 will coexist. And the demand for both will exist for fill in the blank on your projection. Um, Secondly, um, when an RIR uh, depletes its resources and its ability to satisfy an initial allocation, that does not mean that the Internet is out of allocatable resources. They're, that's not true. That means the source of supply, we're going to talk about this region, so Aaron, I think it was two and a half eights, um, is what they have available for initial allocations. They have policies and they have processes and procedures. And as John s showed you, the allocations occur in a periodic sine wave of some kind. I couldn't quite figure out what that was about. Um, but there are peaks and valleys. And it makes prediction of when that final uh, distribution will occur quite, quite difficult. Um, but there is something which Mr. Um, Houston said and which John has echoed, which I would like to dispute a bit. Um, there are over a billion numbers out there uh, that are not being used today. Um, now, not being used as in not being advertised at all anywhere. Now, admittedly, there are ways to use numbers without advertising them. You can put them behind firewalls and run a private network, things like that. But in terms of what's addressable in the public internet, there's over 25% of it that's just not being used. Um, and this is held by a lot of individuals and companies. There were 26,000 entities that received allocations of address space prior to the creation of present RIRs. Um, that's a lot of companies. That, that's a lot of people. Um, and that's a lot of addresses. Now, those that have been distributed or allocated. Um, if you look at the utilization of those, it's actually astonishingly small. Um, so there is a great deal of efficiency left in the numbers which have already been put in place, and there is a vast pool of numbers which can be redistributed. Um, and as John uh, echoed, there are in fact at this point in time zero uh, regional internet registries that have completed the last of their allocations. They all have some amount. Each registry has their own policies on how they deal with that. The final stage policies in APNIC, for example, are different than the John's Aaron region doesn't have a final stage policy. So it's different depending on where you go. Um, now markets, like we represent, they provide a mechanism for redistribution of numbers. That's what, that's what it's about. It's a means to recycle, if you will. Um, and what it really is about, um, this may sound a bit grandiose, we think markets are here to buy time for the adoption of V6. Literally to buy time. Because V6 adoption has not occurred. There is some pain that's associated with V4 number allocations and uses today. And there is a transition period of indefinite period that has to be covered. Um, there has to be a mechanism. Now, 
I think Mr. Houston characterized this as, as uh, undesirable but necessary. Um, I would hope that others might view us as more desirable than that, but um, we'll leave that for the open discussion. Um, and I think for other introductory purposes here, I would observe, uh, since John put it up on his slides, the Science Foundation letter um, stated that a legacy number, and again, language is important, a legacy number using the nomenclature of this region is a number which was allocated prior to the existence of the regional internet registry system. Other places call it early registrations. They, they have different names for it. But effectively, we're talking about the same set of number blocks. These were number blocks passed out by a federal contractor prior to the existence of the regional internet registry system. Those number blocks were given out absent a contract, absent a mechanism for reclamation. Just here, take it. And, and those number blocks, those 26,000 organizations that got them, received a thing of value and all the rights associated. That's what the Science Foundation letter said. Now, the document that came out afterwards, which came from the Department of Commerce, and the clarification statement that came from the Science Foundation, I read both, John, um, doesn't say that's wrong. <laughs> that what it says is the Department of Commerce supports the multi-stakeholder process. It doesn't say anything about whether those previous recipients got a thing or value and the rights associated. Um, and the Science Foundation, again, was not talking about setting policy for anybody. They were saying, we're a federal agency. We hired a contractor. They gave out a number block. And when they did, what they gave was a thing of value and all the rights associated with it. Now, for shorthand, I call that property, but that's a whole different discussion. So, yes, there is some uh, dispute over whether or not an RIR can impose a policy on an entity which is not a member, whether they can retroactively impose a policy or control uh, over the disposition of a transfer. And that should help spark this discussion as we go forward. So I'll stop right there. Thank you. Thanks, Charles. Uh, next up, we're going to have Lee Howard uh, from Time Warner Cable come talk a little bit about some market predictions to uh, get us started. Lee? Thanks, Chris. My name is Lee Howard. I'm, uh, I'm basically a network engineer. I work for Time Warner Cable. And I'm not affiliated with either an RIR or a broker. So um, I don't really have an interest other than being interested. Uh, what I wanted to look at is uh, how to make good decisions about the transition. And how do you know what the right transition strategy for any given organization is? So I've looked at that from a bunch of different angles, and I made a couple of presentations. What I wanted to set the, um, the uh, IM message here for, um, whose link is yeah, um, was to say, um, I, I wanted to say, well, how, so. Uh, uh, Charles just said that there's a billion addresses available, and I kind of wanted to look at, well, how long would a billion addresses last, if that's the case? Um, so I started with the, 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 the NRO, the, Nash, the Number Resource Organization, which is essentially all five RIRs working together. They, they jointly publish some statistics periodically, every, every quarter, I believe, saying how many addresses they've allocated uh, over a given period. Now, the way they usually publish this is they usually show uh, about a, a separate bar for each RIR and how many, uh, how many slash eight equivalents that RIR has allocated. I didn't find that useful because I couldn't visually stack them. So here, I visually stacked those bars over time and then just converted it to a line so that I could do an extrapolation. And I could see over time how many addresses, you know, what's, the, what's the growth rate of the consumption of IPv4 addresses from the RIR system. And surprisingly, I tried a whole bunch of different fits using just Excel extrapolation tools. but. I tried a whole bunch of different fits. And interestingly, a linear fit, a linear growth, was the, the best fit. Um, there really was no change. So, and you can see it goes down over time. It's a little bit lower, a little bit higher over time. But that's the growth rate of demand for IPv4 addresses from the, four, from the five RIRs. Um, you'll note, so the, the, the blue line is how many were, is the actuals. The black line is the extrapolation. I've even given the, the linear formula there. Um, that little x there, sort of off in space, 
That's what it actually was in, 2013, excuse me, in 2012. I didn't use 2012 in extrapolating because, well, obviously, when AP, NIC, and RIPE stopped making allocations, their allocation rate went down. So that didn't seem like a realistic uh, point for extrapolating the rate of allocation over time. So that's sort of what demand is when the price of addresses is essentially you know, between three cents and, and uh, a dollar or so, whatever, whatever the price of addresses is. So then, I also went and looked at route views and said, how many addresses are, as, as Charles said, how many addresses are not being announced on the public internet? And I looked at some of them and said, okay, so maybe the, the, um, the CIPRNet, the, the DOD's uh, secure networks, aren't ever gonna be routed on the internet, but they're actually in use. Okay, so we'll discount some of the standard government networks as, as not being useful. And yet still, I find probably a half a billion addresses are just completely dark, just not, not announced anywhere on, on route views. And another half a billion belong to organizations that are, have had them, that, that are end users, legacy organizations, have had them for a long time, um, or for some reason, and I've got lots and lots of slides and papers on this, but um, for some reason, it looks to me like their uh, rate of utilization is probably less than 50%. So I add that together and say that 50% plus, is half a billion, plus that half a billion of unrouted address space, plus the little bit of space that the RIRs have left, and I get something almost, something approaching 1.2 billion addresses available to be used on the internet that aren't really currently being used, which is significant. That's, that's a significant, you know, a billion, a billion of anything's a lot. And then I said, okay, well, so how long would 1.2 almost billion addresses last? And <clears throat> at that linear extrapolation, the one, the black line from the previous slide, at that linear extrapolation, again, assuming zero dollars, this is not a supply curve, this is assuming straight allocation at the continuing rate of demand that we saw before, I say that we would run out, that, that's the blue line, that linear, linear extrapolation says we'll run out at the end of 2015. That's only a year and a half away. I mean, that's, we're pretty close to that already. If instead of, if you say, okay, well, but people were accelerating their rate of demand and expectation and anticipation, anticipation of run out, or uh, if for some reason you think that the linear extrapolation is too high, let's just take the peak, the 2012 allocation rate, and say, what if it stays solid at, or, or stays flat at 15 slash eight equivalents per year? That's the red line. So no increase in demand, but demand holds steady where it was. And that's the red line, and even there, Pretty early in 2017, I would estimate that we would run out of addresses. Again, this is not a supply curve. There's nothing in here saying anything about dollars. This is if we continue burning addresses or uh, assigning addresses at the rates we did before. Now that green line is to say, okay, maybe the entire history, all of history is the anomaly, and last year's single data point is the true value of the demand for IPv4 addresses. Let's take that rate. And so that's, you can see, obviously, a much flatter rate. And obviously, with RIPE and APNIC barely handing out any addresses in their, in their austerity phases, um, the, the, number, the, the rate of allocation was much, much lower. And so there, it goes out to something like 2027. Okay, so um, that's a much longer rate. But I included that for thoroughness. I actually think the date, the, 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 the real burn, the, the real demand for IPv4 is somewhere around the, the blue and red lines. I can talk a lot more about what a supply curve would actually look like when you actually start to map dollars on that, and I'll start to get into that in, uh, in a later presentation. But I thought that, that there's sort of how long would, would any of this last in a, in a, uh, a perfect a, a demand-driven market is uh, really not all that long at all. And that's all I wanted to set up for the, uh, for the initial context. Thanks. Thanks, Lee. Uh, and next up with opening remarks, um, before we jump into the conversation, is uh, Louis Starkey with the Colorama Group. Um, so, my name is Louis Sturkey. Uh, thanks for, for having me. Um, Calorama Group is a Washington, D.C. based internet numbers uh, broker. We're APNIC, uh, Aaron, and RIPE uh, approved brokers. 
Um, the, we're also a, uh, the sister company of uh, Fairwinds Partners, which is uh, an internet names, uh, an online brand advisory group. Um, what we wanted to talk to you guys today about, and, and there's obviously a lot of ways we can take this, but we were, in, we were intrigued recently by the, by the no need policy um, that, Ripe, that Tor Anderson of, of Ripe uh, has proposed. And one of the things that we found very interesting was um, the uh, extent to which that has really gained momentum. When we spoke with uh, Mr. Anderson about 10 days ago, um, he, he had told us that uh, I think thus far, and of course it still is in the early phases, but I think there are 22 yays and two nays. And so what's interesting is, is in our view, and of course, it's very, John pointed out that they're in a little bit different stage than we are because they're already uh, in post -exha exhaustion. But it's very interesting for us to think about how that mind, sh that, that mind, that sort of that sea change happens so quickly. And so one of the things we wanted to look at today, and again, there are a lot of what places we could take this, but we wanted to sort of let you guys know, the, or let the community know the way we see some of the hot button issues as it re relates to utilization. Um, and, and, and I think some of the things that utilization was, um, was put in place to prevent, we wanted to sort of give you our take on what we see and what we don't see. Um, and so, you know, I, just a couple quick points here. Um, you know, obviously people would say that, you know, speculating and hoarding is bad, and we, we agree with that. Um, and, and that utilization does a good job of mitigating those concerns. Um, but here's the reality. Um, do we see speculators in this market? The answer is unequivocally, we do not. Um, why? Because it is far too speculative of, a, of an asset class, and I use that term um, in a non, uh, uh, I use the word asset class in a non, um, uh, sort of non-confrontational ma manner, <laughs> not in a, you know, uh, a policy manner. Um, the amount of, so the amount of money that would be required to do something of, of incremental um, interest for a speculator is such, and let's just call it a $10 an IP address. The amount of money that would, that would be required to do something that would be in, incrementally interesting to a real investor is large enough that it's going to keep unsophisticated money at bay and the people who have the types of checks that could really speculate aren't, they, they didn't get those checks, they didn't get the ability to write those checks by being, you know, I'd say careless or clumsy with their money. Um, these are not people who go to Las Vegas. Um, these are professional institutional investors. Um, and so I, I guess the, the long and short of it is um, we view speculators, and even if you think about, um, if you think about the large uh, incumbents in technology land as being, um, you know, basically having the right to speculate as well, um, that's a sort of a different issue, um, but still one we, we don't think we see a lot of signs of. Um, secondly, um, if you did away with utilization, um, do, would that, uh, would speculative behavior increase? Uh, we'd say that it would on the margin, but we, where we disagree is the amount of, we, we don't, we, we think that given the amount, the, the, the amount of supply that really is out there that is available, I, I would sort of, I, I'm not, the, the billion dollar, or sorry, the, the billion address figure that's been mentioned here, we think that the amount that one could really actually get is far less than that. And so it might increase speculative behavior a little bit, but we still don't think that in the scheme of things when the bigger problem is really getting to V6, we don't think that really does very much, we don't think that moves the needle really very much to begin with. So it, we just, uh, you know, I'm not, we're not saying it's not a concern and we're not, dis, we're not discounting it. Sorry, we're not dismissing it, we're just rather discounting it. So then that brings us to, to the last slide, which is um, in, in the, you know, bear case worst outcome, uh, how much havoc could a speculator wreak in this in, in, in IPv4 v6 transition world? Um, and the answer is if you if you tomorrow handed um, 50 million IP addresses to a bad actor in some capacity, 
um, what would they what power would they actually be able to wield? And when you think about that in the context of, um, you know, maybe that would if, even if that caused prices to skyrocket or, or what have you, what would that really do? And we would argue that because it's such a small relative percentage, it wouldn't do very much. So the long and short of it is hoarding and speculating are things that one would want to prevent, but we're not seeing that and we're not so sure that policy should be so strong to prevent things that we are not yet seeing. In other words, there shouldn't be policy to um, you know, if something hasn't happened yet, we don't need roadblock. We, we, we need to be careful with the roadblocks we put in place um, uh, before we actually see real signs of that occurring. Um, and just to sort of uh, to, to speed through this next slide, um, this is sort of at a high level and it's topical and it's somewhat provocative um, just for the just to sort of get the the the, the conversation moving. Um, you know, we are. We're not, we just wanted to bring to the, the point that we're not, so, we're not so sure that some of these things don't actually inadvertently slow, thwart, sorry, slow down or thwart the transition to IPv6. Um, in other words, so, so just to run through this list, you know, hoarding, in, hoarding, albeit bad, might actually be good for IPv6 because it would mean, it would, it would decrease supply and increase price. Speculating, not good, um, but we think that there are measures in place that, that Aaron and other registries currently have that could be even, even strengthened, that could really hamper the bad actors who were trying to speculate. And again, the percentage of those bad actors is very much in the, that, we, that might be there, would, would be very much in the minority. So, to, and to, to be specific on that, if you want to add a one to two year caller post-purchase that's similar to the policy that's in place today. In other words, a after you, you make a, a purchase of, an, of, a, of a block of IP addresses, you're not able to go back to the market or you're not, not able to flip it as is currently in, in, uh, you know, in, in place. Those are the types of things that we think that could be strengthened even to keep, if the, if the concern of, um, of speculating is, is you know, really is a concern, then we think those types of policies could keep, could thwart the the interest of the of the speculator. So any type of soft landing concept, in addition to a market, which is what we do, so bo including both of those, um, you know that those. And again, this is there's you guys. There's a lot of different opinions on this, but on the margin, it's probably not very good for us really finding religion and reaching IPv6. And the, and then the last thing is is we think that as most people in this room are going to think, and as most people on the stage are going to think, that the process, the transfer process, uh, and the visibility around approval, et cetera, to the extent that that could happen more fastidiously and be more out in the open and be, be clearer, um, we think that that would do a great deal, that we think that's very much would be pro IPv6 because what we're currently seeing is there are a lot of bots, so for a couple reasons. One is we think that the murkiness and the uncertainty around um, the transfer of the rights to the resources, and again, I use the word resources, um, uh, you know, in a, in a light manner. Um, we think that that keeps sort of a synthetic ceiling on price, and we think it, it pushes the marginal buyer towards IPv6. Uh, sorry, 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 towards uh, CGN, um, which basically means that the it makes it that much harder to un unscramble the egg um, as the network gets more complex, as Jeff has described on numerous occasions. So. I, I think what we would sort of suggest is um, that utilization is great for the free pool. Um, utilization in the transfer market is um, should be liberalized, and it, it, because the transfer market is not, I, I actually would, would disagree with Charles. I don't view it as um, something that is a, um, a, an integral, a, a very a huge part of the transition to IPv6. I view it as a very, very tiny um, uh, subset for companies that need that need resources and resources for business continuity and business planning reasons. But I don't view it as like is one of the main um, components of of that transition. And so, accordingly, um, you know, I, I think a, a a market that that is, I'd say, more liberal does the best job of, um, uh, I'd say. 
I think price in and of itself does the, in free markets do a better job of uh, ascribing the, the necessary checks and balances um, and just do a better job than uh, very onerous utilization rules. And again, I want to I want to separate the thought between free pool and transfer because uh, it's a, it's a d definitely a different concept. Um, anyway, I uh, I'll we'll open it up now. So thanks for your time. Thanks, Lewis. So we're going to go ahead and open up the panel now. If anyone has questions, um, do you have one? Do you have a microphone? We share. I do. I have one. I just need to turn it on. Okay. Sharing with me can be a hazard. Right. <laughs> That's a great deal. That's a great deal. Okay. Um, yeah. So again, any questions from the audience? I have some questions as well. So feel free to jump up, and then uh, I'll shoot mine in as there's a lull. A uh, question for Mr. Sturkey. Can you characterize what you mean by speculators? And what I'm thinking is uh, private public sector uh, enterprise versus ISP versus broker, uh, what that impact might be. And the second part of the question is, do you see any analogies with Spectrum uh, FCC and, and reallocation that also apply with uh, IPv4 exhaustion, IPv6 deployment? On the, the the first question is is, a, is I, one that I tried to distinguish and, and I didn't do a good job of um, the I'd say the in, the technology incumbent like the ISP turn speculator um, is a different it, that's a that that's a a, a legitimate concern um, given their ability to um, uh, you know to really go in and potentially take up a significant amount of resources given their deep, deep pockets. I will say though that my, my problem with that is, is utilization already does that for the big guys, and here's how: um, two years worth of um, of uh, in, in transfers or three months worth, okay, uh, is a, a land grab that is very much in favor of the incumbent in a world of diminishing resources, in a world of unexhaustible resources. It's a it's a free it's a it's a free game, but when you as you get as that big incumbent ISP or, or Whatever you know, managed managed hosting, whatever you want to define it as, who who would need this resource? As you approach exhaustion, two years worth for them is incrementally so much more than it is for the little guy, right? That that all of a sudden, what used to be such a small percentage, they're getting that much more um, as we approach, you know, whatever whichever one of Lee's Lee's line you believe in, right? So I, I think I think the um, your point is a good one that the incumbent turn uh, speculator is a concern, but they already have that advantage to begin with, I'd argue. Um, the, the speculator, which is the, 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 the way I was using it more, um, which would be like the, the, the financial buyer or, or the, the, non, uh, the person who wasn't able to necess necessarily demonstrate need um, or, or was it, you're trying to somehow think this was a, um, a really, clever, uh, really clever way to sort of game the system. My argument there is that it, 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 this is far, far, far too speculative, and that that is something that we've never, I, I, I've never received a phone call uh, that even comes close to, uh, you know, something where it's, it seemed, uh, it, it sort of didn't pass the smell test. If that makes, where I, I said, oh, you know, my, uh, the alarm went off and said, oh goodness, this is a speculator. I mean, I just, and I'm not saying, I'm not saying we wouldn't get there. But I, you know, in a couple years, but it certainly isn't something that I think the community should spend a whole lot of time worrying about. I think that issues like speculating and hoarding, the energy that's spent on that, should be reallocated towards uh, effectively engaging the C the C suite about IPv6, because there's a lot of energy wasted on such a very small percentage. Like this is not to disagree with Charles and Lee, but I, I view the amount of space that really is movable as so small. And I, yet, and then it's such a disconnect between what the C-suite who actually may, might be able to make the decisions between what they know and between what they need to know. So I, I think that we should, we'd be better off to bottle that energy on, spend on, you know, worrying about speculating and, and sort of reallocate it towards trying to engage the, the C-suite community. I, and I can't comment on the, on the spectrum. Um, to piggyback on some of that, um, part of the, challenge here is defining what's a speculator. Um, 
there are small scale speculators out there today. Um, there are people who buy number blocks and then want to resell them because they think if I buy it today and I <coughs> wait six months, I'll get a higher price. The, the thing that he's correct about is whether it's large scale. Right. Um, it's not of such a concern that you need to go create a specific policy to bar something that's relatively not going to impact uh, the entire ecosystem of the internet. Um, but there are companies that build themselves as a broker, buy a number block, and then offer it at a fixed price to a potential buyer. And that's a reseller, and that's a speculator. That's what they're doing. Um, we don't. Um, we, for example, are not a broker. Um, we're a marketplace. We don't operate a store. We don't, and this is a challenge. People have a desire for a store. They, they call us a lot and say, what's the price of an internet number? And our answer is, that's up to you. We can help you figure out the value, but we're not a, we're not a store. We can't give you a price. And one of the things I'd like to talk about here while we're here is what is the value of a number? Um, I think that would be useful, and I think it would be something that you all could take away and, and put to good use in your own businesses. It, it, isn't it whatever the buyer and the seller agree it is? No. <laughs> That's the price. <laughs> I'd like to talk, before we talk about the value or the price of a number, I'd like to clarify one thing about what an address block is. Because uh, I think actually while there is a, a, a significant point of disagreement between myself and Charles Lee uh, on one aspect, there is something of agreement as well. The agreement is that um, parties who receive address blocks have rights to them. Aaron doesn't dispute that. In fact, we will formalize that via a contract with a party. They have specific rights. There's some discussion over what those rights are, okay? But at the end of the day, um, those rights are a bundle. They're a thing of value. They, can, we, they have been part of estates, bankruptcy estates and other estates. Um, so there's no question that there's, there's value and there's uh, an, an address block represents a set of rights that have uh, some sort of a value associated with it. I guess the key difference is that um, Aaron harkens back to the conditions under which those were assigned, and uh, and that is pre-Aaron, as it turns out. They were assigned according to government contracts. For example, the NSF cooperative agreement says they were signed in the in the accordance with the provisions of RFC 1174, which, when you actually go read, you realize, wow, what got assigned is a subset of what you might think about when you look at rights. So there is an agreement that, that parties who are address holders have rights to those address blocks. Um, there might be disagreement over exactly what those rights are. Aaron will tell you that those rights are to um, be listed as the exclusive registrant for them and to transfer them in accordance with the community policies. But uh, there's no doubt about it. There's something here. It has value. It has price. And uh, it's probably worth talking about. We got a couple, couple folks in the front row here. We'll, we'll come to you just one second. Since the, the first question came out on speculation, I kind of wanted to expand on that a little bit because I think a, a lot of talk happens around speculation itself, right? The idea of someone coming in, buying addresses, trying to corner the market and resell those addresses at a higher price. And, and I think that the policy constraints that are in place, at least in Aaron and, and in APNIC right now, protect against more than just that. And so I want to kind of look at the other, the other things that are going on with the needs-based allocation, which is, and it came up a little bit, right, the idea of an incumbent or a monopolist, right? So some of the largest ISPs, at least in this country and around the world, are, you know, multiple orders of magnitude larger and have bank accounts multiple orders of magnitude larger than some of the smaller ISPs or some of the other players. And so if you remove a needs-based qualification, um, what, are the, what are the other effects, other than speculation, right? Can a large ISP come in and buy up all of the addresses available on the market and shut out every other ISP? 
can a content provider come in and buy up all the addresses and shut out the ISPs and force them to come through them to get addresses? Can an equipment manufacturer come in and buy enough addresses to force you to buy their gear because it's the only gear that comes with IP addresses? Right, so outside of just trying to make money and trying to speculate, are there other things that can happen when people can buy addresses with no restriction? And, 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 and are those things an issue or not? So I, anyone want to go first on that? Sure. So I'll, I'll take it. So it's a it's a really good question. Uh, just to reiterate, um, the 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 I think in the just to reiterate the my other point earlier, in an exhaust in, in a world where it's in, where it's um, you know approaching zero, those the the small the small person who is already at a disadvantage in utilization, um, and so it does your it, you know and to be I I think that um, the um, hyperbolic you know. Uh, you know, example you just uh, mentioned is a grave concern of somebody maybe taking every single last address in one fell swoop. I, I don't think that that, I think, A, there are measures that could be put in place to prevent such a, you know, had that happening on such a large scale, and, and B, I don't think that that would really ever happen, um, just because I, I don't, um, you know, C, I think that there could be a, it could, act, it could help a, um, a new young venture that had money um, go in and actually um, acquire what they thought they needed for five years versus for, for, for two. Um, so it is, it is something that is, that your point is, a, is, a, is certainly a, a concern, but I'm not so sure that this is, um, the community is incredibly worried about this, and I'm just saying that in, of what the community needs to be worried about, if the objective is IPv6, I'm not, I don't think that this is the number one concern. Okay. Lee? <clears throat> For what it's worth, um, although I'm a big fan of IPv6, um, I don't think IPv6 is a goal. I think it's a mechanism to deliver the goal, which is internet access. Um, and <clears throat> for me, the reason I do the kinds of analysis that I do is to figure out the most cost-effective way to provide that internet access, which brings me to why would an ISP try to corner the market on IPv4 addresses? Well, if they did that, then they would find there was no longer any market for IPv4 addresses because everybody else would have had to go to IPv6 because there were no more IPv4 addresses left. So there's no community, you know, there's, there's nobody to communicate with anymore. Um, similarly, I, I think it's also, it would really be cost prohibitive. I mean, maybe the first couple of million would be at you know a, you know nine to twelve dollars per address which is sort of what we've kind of seen but boy those last five million addresses would probably be a little bit more than that if word got out that right. one a company was buying all of the addresses on the market which is the whole point of an actual supply curve is that it's curved so the quantity available changes according to the price and so I, I don't think I, I really don't think I, I agree that it, with, uh, with Lewis that it's really not realistic for one organization to corner the market, um, no matter what kind of organization it is. I, I do fear a, a world where uh, some vendor decides that the, their CGN is going to be packaged with a slash 24. Every card you buy has another slash 24 uh, shipped with it. That, that, that's not a scenario that I really like, but then again, that's not a product I really want to buy either. <laughs> yeah, and, and I agree that uh, creating specific policies for such a low likelihood is probably not time well spent. Um, there's just other things to be concerned about. Um, and I'll throw one on the table because we're supposed to be sparking some discussion. Um, one would be a commitment to the accuracy of the registry. Uh, that's not a specific policy. That's a commitment. That's an overarching commitment. And if you don't have that overarching commitment, you may end up with unintended consequences of some policies that sit underneath it. So. There's, there's got to be a place for the discussion of what are we trying to achieve, what are the important aspects, and that's where I would encourage time and energy to be spent. John? It's 4.10 p.m., record the date and time, as I agree with Charles Lee. <laughs> um, so uh, it is true that the ability to transfer addresses has uh, relevancy to the ability to maintain accuracy of the registry. We know that the transfer policies uh, that Aaron has formalized to date have resulted in some cases in transfers 
that were record keeping that would have been difficult to accomplish otherwise. Uh, as I said, an organization that lent an IP address block to someone and could never figure out how to get that corrected or updated because it wasn't something that was supposed to happen. They should have come to Aaron directly. Well, do you want to go find a middle school and force them to renumber uh, 200 PCs because they happen to be using an address block of a, of a government agency? No, the government agency connected them to the internet back before most of the people in this room had even heard of it. Now we just want to update the records. So there is a value to having transfer policies um, which apply in some cases to accuracy. Um, I, I want to be clear though, because I heard someone say earlier, Aaron's transfer policies, and, and I just want to point out a little detail. Um, Aaron was formed in December of 1997, okay? So Aaron's policies start definitely after that point. Um, in uh, 1996, there was RIPE, APNIC, and the Internic. The Internic was that government contract uh, to network solutions to provide administration of IP addresses. And they published a document that stated their current policies and procedures. One of the authors on the document was a guy named John Postel. He did something with the Internet. Um, and uh, this current document that stated their current policies and procedures is RFC 2050, published a year before Aaron was formed. Um, RFC 2050 has in it a statement. I'll read it verbatim. The transfer of IP addresses from one party to another must be approved by the regional registries. Okay, interesting. The party trying to obtain the IP address space must meet the same criteria as if they were requesting IP address space directly from the internet registry. This is in 1996, the current policies of the Internic, uh, RIPE and APNIC said if you wanted to transfer your address block, you were subject to making sure the party who was going to get it needed it. Now, this kind of wasn't very well used, wasn't very well documented, and at one point in the Aaron region, a number of people said, look, we need a nice way to do transfers, one that's clean and understandable. And we ended up with a well-documented Aaron transfer policy, and it's led to um, exactly what we've seen, the start of a market, but a market that carries over some of those original restrictions. Um, the good news is that it's very clear at this point that the policies that are used in the administration of address space are able to be set by the community. We have a multi-stakeholder, community-based process. You folks have the ability to change this in each of the RIRs and set the policy. So the fact that we have 15-year-old policy document does not mean that we're bound by that. In fact, a number of us got in a room and have submitted a draft of RFC 2050 that describes the structure of the registry system without the policy because it has been overtaken by events. But the good news is when we talk here about things that would make for better transfer policy, it's actually within the ability of the community to make those changes. But I want people to understand the original policy and the constructions that we work under, they actually didn't originate with Aaron, they were preconditions at the start of the registry system. Front here first. Was there? You still have a question? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, at risk of sort of starting any any wars here, um, I would um, That's why we're point here. out that why we're um, there is quite a bit of speculation in Bitcoin. And I think there's a very reasonable argument to make that these numbers are actually more valuable than those numbers. <laughs> um, and so I think, I think you should take the, the speculation you know, issue um, seriously. Um, as to the question of value of an IP, um, in the late 90s I worked for an ISP that charged $25 a month for an IP address, mm -hmm. which is not a number I've heard anybody quote since. But I would uh, suggest that um, that it is also a, a valuable thing. So anyway, it is indeed quite valuable. Um, there is a, a little formula that we worked out, uh, which would help you all compute the value to your organization of a particular IP number. If you give me just a second. I got it scribbled down here, so I would get it correct. 
Um, it starts with leverage. What's your ability to leverage? Can you oversubscribe? Um, can I get eight customers off a particular number? Or do I undersubscribe? I need eight numbers to serve one customer, in which case it would be a fractional number. So if it was 800% you know, efficiency, write down eight. If you need two numbers, write down 0.5. Now, what's the service contract worth to me? $25 a number, $10, that's usually per month, so be sure to, to note that because it will come into play very quickly. So the number of contracts I can support with a given number plus the revenue that I can get from that given number, now you've got to start decrementing a bit. What's my margin on that number, the incremental margin that it contributes to my company? If my infrastructure is fully built out and all my operations are fully there and I don't have to hire a single person or put in place another router, well, the incremental margin is perfect. It's 100% contribution. On the other hand, if you've got to grow some of your infrastructure and your support services, you, you need to put that in there to get a reasonable expectation. Now, this tends to be a very large number. Um, so, you know, we'll do, we'll do a very simple case. Um, we'll say efficiency is one. One customer, one contract, one number. We'll say it's a $10 per month commitment that I get out of that contract. $10 per month. And my margin, 50%. That means one number is worth $5 per month to my organization. Five dollars per month. Now, how long will I have that number? Uh, anybody want to guess? How many numbers do I acquire in a block? If it's a 16, there's 65,536 of them. If it's some other <laughs> block, it's multiply it up. Um, is there residual value? Can I resell it if, in fact, my forecasts change? What's my deployment plan? How long will it take me to, to build up to using all of those numbers? Boil all of that down, make some very broad generalizations, and you're looking at people recovering their investment on today's market prices the first month, first month. So why? Why is there such a discrepancy between the value and the price that's in the market. Um, there's only one explanation. That's all the other factors that get applied. Uncertainty of outcome. This is one you talked right. about. If I buy it, will I actually get it? Or is some third party gonna say, no, I don't care if you bought it. I'm only gonna put a piece of it in my registry. Uh, what happens to the rest? I don't know. I don't run a registry, but I know that they're not going to put it in because it didn't meet the policy, so it's just going to go into limbo. Um, there's other factors here, and this is why you need somebody like us, because there's a lot of things that go into this. Is it the rightful seller? Does the party that's offering this actually have the rights to it? Turns out about 30% of the people that come to us are not the rightful seller and we have to turn them away because it's not theirs to sell. That's an astonishingly high figure. Um, but we cannot get engaged in that. With it, we, if it's not yours, we're not going to help you sell it. Um, they need validation of their rights. They need that documented in some way. Because the original registry entry could be 25 years old. And a heck of a lot has happened in the meantime. Somebody's got to draw the line to connect the original allocation to the party that's got it now. Are there any liens, encumbrances, pending litigation? Um, there's a lot of research that's necessary before you can say, yep, that's his to sell. That's valuable. That's valuable to buyers. They want to know, yeah, that's the right party. That's valuable to Aaron. That's valuable to everybody. Um, then you got to go through 
good old marketing 101. You got to package, you got to promote, you got to find applicable buyers, you got to make sure they're qualified, you got to have a process that protects everybody. You don't get your numbers, you don't get your money until both parties get satisfied. Um, there's a lot to the process. You don't just jump into this. And then the buyers, the buyers need protections as well. They have a whole different set of concerns after you get past, am I dealing with the right party? Is this number block harmed? What's the reputational score? Is it sitting on a blacklist and I can't use it? And how the heck do you undo that? There's 300 and some odd independent operators out there and none of them are coordinated. And all you can get is a snapshot today. You can't say tomorrow it won't be on a blacklist either. So you, there's work to be done here. You, um, you've got to fully disclose the obligations. If a seller has a number block that's under an RSA with Aaron, I have to fully disclose if I'm doing a rightful job, you, Mr. Buyer, this is what's going to happen. This is what you're acquiring, and this is the obligations that come out of it. And these are the things you have to do to exact that transaction. He needs to know that. Otherwise, it's not an informed sale. And then I get asked the hard question, well, can you guarantee that this transaction will be approved? Nope. Absolutely not. I have no way to control a third party, in this case, Aaron, um, or to tell you how long it would take, um, the likelihood of success. I just can't make those predictions. So you take all of those factors and you start boiling it down, and now you find out why the price is remarkably different than the value. Now, can those things be addressed? Absolutely. Should they be addressed? Most assuredly. Um, are they being addressed? Partially. John? So, I'm actually going to look again. Wow, it's 423 and I'm agreeing again. Um, so, uh, to a great extent, what, what uh, Mr. Lee said is correct regarding the factors of uncertainty that enter this. And some slice of that is the policy. Um, we actually have a listing service. A party can tell, come to us and say, I want to be validated to be able to receive a certain block. We also have a listing service. The other side of it says someone can say, I wish to have my registration verified by Aaron. So we can pre-clear those. That's not frequently used. People don't use them, but they can. Um, and that's kind of the extent that we go. The policies, obviously, those are in your hands. Um, the simpler they are, the less, the less uncertainty is created. Some of the other aspects are, are, will remain uncertain. Um, it is true that, that uh, we can do some things to make this easier, um, but at the end of the day, if you listen to the long list of activities, it is true that parties that wish to make use of a transfer have got to realize there is a lot of work involved. And um, we don't do that at Aaron for you. Uh, we tell you, come to us and you tell us why you're the registered owner, because it says Fred Smith and you're, you know, uh, Jim Jones. And um, uh, without a broker or a market to help them, some of these companies come back and go, I don't even know where to start at correcting that. And so um, there is some value here, but even if the policy weren't uh, something that is perceived as an issue, um, recognize that's still not going to give a very liquid market because of the challenges uh, that, that Mr. Lee also listed. Some of those things will be there one way or the other and will have to be addressed. Okay. I want to ask you a question because I'm not sure I understood when you were talking about your, your, your formula for addresses. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> you said that uh, the, the second factor was the revenue per address. Are you yeah. talking about the revenue of the entire value of the contract or the revenue, the uh, incremental revenue for the uh, value of having that address? In other words, was it the $25 a month lease IPv4 surcharge or the $25 a month uh, internet access charge? It depends on each application. So, so in his case, if the only thing that's encumbered or, or offered for lease, because it's a separate line item on the bill, mm -hmm. is $25 per number, yep, 25 bucks. Okay. On the other hand, if you're offering a service and you haven't discreetly broken out the number, you need to do that um, because, the, and that goes to margin, right? Well, that, and that's so, exactly, yeah. exactly the reason I ask is that you, you either end up 
you, you as the ISP either end up cutting your margin in order to bake that cost in, right. or you add the, the IPv4 surcharge, the additional cost. And I wonder, well, so I know that the ISPs that I've seen, and I'm not going to speak on behalf of an ISP that I work for, but I've seen, worked for several ISPs, and the uptake on a static IPv4 address assignment fee is fairly low because it's an extra charge every month. So <clears throat> the hardest part, where I was going with all of that, and still more of that, was the hardest part about being an IPv4 address buyer is not figuring out the right price, and it's not figuring out whether you're going to get the addresses. It's figuring out how many addresses you want to buy. Because if you decide to buy enough addresses for what you think you're going to grow for five years, well then, <clears throat> Aaron's not going to transfer all but, you know, but two years of that, and you end up having some capital stranded while you wait for your, your growth to get over that time. So how much capital are you willing to strand times your net present value of money and your you know, discount rate over time, and it's an incredibly complicated set of things to do. You may know what an address is worth to you next month, but it's still really hard to figure out, especially with V6 being a more realistic uh, substitute over time. In two years, five years, 10 years, we don't know when. We should talk about when, but we don't know when. Um, so how, again, how, much, how, how big a block do you want to buy? Well, you know, what you, what, one of the things you talked about, and I believe me, I appreciate this. We've, we've been through this innumerable times. Um, but one of the limiting factors on how much you buy is how much can you get registered in your name. I can't control that. That's a policy discussion, and I'm, that's not me. All right? So if you think that your business uh, should not be hamstrung with a three-month supply for initial allocation, because who's going to build a business on a three-month supply? Um, go go get engaged in the policy discussion and say, that's absurd. I can't get anything invested with three months supply. Uh, on the other hand, if you think two years is limiting you for an acquisition, yeah, I, I, I can't change that. Um, what I can do is make you aware and tell you, you want to buy five years, provided it's the right kind of block. There are sellers out there provided the terms and conditions are acceptable to both parties, right? Um, there are sellers out there who will sell you those numbers. And some of them are saying, if you want to update the registry, go ahead. I'm not going to. I, the seller, am not going to go to Aaron and say, in order to start this process, I'm going to sign an RSA with you for a block that I intend to sell tomorrow. They're not going to do that. And part of that is to do with the contract language of the RSA, and part of that is why. The only reason I would do that is to update a registry, which you're going to turn around and update as soon as there's a new buyer. Um, so they're not going to do that. And while those constraints exist, you limit the supply of IPv4 numbers available. It's an artificial constraint. And that artificial constraint gets translated into artificial numbers in the marketplace. It, it also gets, it also gets, so it also keeps prices low. Artificially it, so. Yes. Right, in which, in which again, I, I think prolongs IPv6. Um, and I also would say gotcha. the, the murkiness around, um, you know, and, and sort of the, I think John mentioned sort of the, the sweat equity that's um, required from both the buyer and seller to get something consummated again, pushes the marginal buyer towards CGN, right. or to double down on CGN. And that is uh, increment, that, that does incrementally more damage than a speculator who, um, you know, goes in and tries to do, you know, so, or, or, the a purported right. speculator ever could. And, and your Bitcoin, and now your Bitcoin comparison is a really, really good one. Um, you know, it, it um, if some, you know, I think if something were to get really, really violent, um, which I, I don't think it ever would, but let's just say something got really violent like Bitcoin did and we, you saw some huge spike <laughs> on a piece of the market, uh, then what? You know, I, I don't, I, I, okay, that's 0.05% of, of available IPv4 space, uh, you know, that, that, that spiked or whatever, the, it's, a, it's, an incon it's, it's not a meaningful amount necessarily because it's, very, it's a, keep in mind, fairly liquid, so I don't think you're gonna see that in, in great volume. So even if you were to see that, um, 
this, you know, the rest of the world's still going, you know, I think the rest of the community is still going to, would still work just fine. And keep in mind that when the music stops, <laughs> that guy who paid that or the, the, the company that paid that, when the music stops, you know, that's just, it's, um, you know, it's not worth anything. So. I just want to um, add a little insight. So uh, if indeed uh, you get uh, wild swings in market prices, and this becomes a more fluid market. I'm not sure that the addresses that aren't routed is actually the limit of the addresses that could be transferred. Exactly. Um, there are parties who have addresses that they've assigned, one per desktop, one per customer, that might decide 10 customers per IP is fine, and nine IPs in a liquid, high price market makes sense. So there are sort of um, barriers that get broken through at certain price tiers. It is not inconceivable to see someone turn around and say, I'm going to get more efficient with my address usage for V4 and liquidate some of my uh, current holdings. Uh, and maybe I will use NAP because shoot, I don't need everyone in my company to have a unique address. I can put them, oh, there's this net 10 that everyone uses and I can use it too. <laughs> and I'll, I'll take the rest of the desk block and put it back. Now, people will say, well, that's not really gonna happen, but you also forget at a high enough price point and knowing the uncertainty of how long V4 addresses hold value, okay? It's five years from now, 10 years from now, there may be no value right. to that address. So at certain price points, you will motivate sets of behaviors we haven't conceived of. I don't know whether or not a more liquid market will enable that or not. I, I have no views on what policies should apply to the market. Your, go your job. But I do want to say um, it's not just the unrouted pool that's subject to these market dynamics. I, I think you're exactly correct. Um, so, you know, will the market will the market evolve? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, will there be a long-term pool of people that are interested in V4 number blocks? Absolutely. Um, but I, it's going to come down to unique individual requirements. I used to work at a reasonably large telco. Um, the big V. Um, they they have all kinds of internal discussions about uh, technologies and deployments and business cases and and I can tell you, uh, having bloodied my nose many times, um, the question that gets asked is where are my customers? Um, and if my customers are not on this other island, I'm not going and I'm not giving you the money to get there. Um, so business cases become really, really important um, for anything. It is, as Mr. Houston pointed out, economics. Economics are really important. Um, for a long time, um, technical bodies, engineers, engineering groups, things like that, they never thought about presenting a business case for acquiring number blocks. Now you do, and you, that's a whole new um, joyful experience for you. Um, you're going to have to justify investing capital expenditure, and you didn't have to do it before. Sure. Uh, we, we're running out of time, and I want to get to those last three questions. So we're going to kind of do rapid fire, ask a question. We'll have one person respond, and, and we'll kind of tear through the questions here. OK, well, I've been <clears throat> trying to get in for a while. Uh, I actually want to go back to the discussion of rights. Uh, with value, the uh, the true right with value, as I perceive it on the number block, is the ability to route it. And that right is not granted really by Aaron, but more by the people that actually run routers, which Aaron doesn't have much control over. Um, coming back to the policy issue, though, um, we're talking about spending too much time on uh, putting policy in place to create roadblocks to free transfers, but in reality, the policies are already there. So if we spend no time on it, then we just leave them alone and the roadblocks that have served the community very well simply stay in place. I'd like to pick up. Yeah. Uh, oh, and on the rights issue, uh, yeah, the rights that, that uh, exist 
to an address block in the registry are very nominal. That's the right to be associated with it, the right to transfer it in accordance with policy. Um, uh, that's, you know, having an address block in the registry is a very small set of rights. And the RIRs don't control routing. At the end of the day, the fact that you're the address block holder doesn't mean that necessarily any ISP will or will not um, uh, use, uh, will route you. You can use any addresses you want in your routers. Isn't that amazing? It, you can set anything you want. But, but there is a system of unique addresses there's actually multiple one. I know private industries have their own private registries. But there is an internet registry system, the IR system, was set up by the US government, and it provides one set of unique numbers, of which Aaron is part of that internet registry system. So no one's saying you can't think you own a number. Feel free to think you own a number. But if you think you have an entry in that unique internet registry system, you've got to play with that unique internet registry system's rules. Next question? No. Oh. Just a couple of comments. Um, one, you had mentioned that uh, legacy holders would never go to Aaron and, and you know, basically, uh, I get that. They wouldn't initiate anything with Aaron, but in order for transfers to go through, they still have to deal with Aaron, and if I'm not mistaken, they have to sign a revised RSA. Uh, if you're transferring the entire address block and you're the rightful holder, we don't actually make you sign the RSA. We validate that you're the rightful holder and you're transferring the whole block. If you're not transferring the whole block, you will end up signing an RSA. That can have an implication, um, but recognize the, R the LRSA says we won't take the address block for la back for lack of utilization. So it's a relatively safe maneuver. If you look at the list of transfers that have occurred, some of them are very large legacy holders who have come in, signed an LRSA, and are now transferring pieces out from under that. It's becoming quite common. Right. Um, you know, another part of this is, I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's pretty foolish to enter into any type of these uh, transactions without proper legal counsel. And, uh, you know, whether you leave capital stranded because you can't justify your entire space uh, or you have back out clauses in your contracts that you're dealing with. I mean, that's, that's just obvious to me. Um, <laughs> excuse me. The other thing is, in regards to the value of IPs, I, I don't know that, I mean, what you had mentioned was interesting, but I don't think that there's uh, a way that the entire community can put a value on an IP. I don't even think within, a, an in, within one business you can put the same value on an IP based on the different types of services that you offer. Right. I, I, thank you. Um, that's precisely what I meant. It's an individual thing. There is no global uh, uniform value. The value to an organization, it will be different from their next door neighbor. The, the value and the associated price, in our opinion, has to be determined exclusively by the buyer. What's it worth to him? And then you have the terms and conditions and sale and all the other things that lead to price. But yes, you're right. There is no unified global number that everyone can agree is the value. Not true. Next comment. Um, we spent a lot of time talking about transfers, which are discrete events. Um, pretty easy to update all the paperwork, IRR, Aaron, registry. Uh, no one's talking about leases. Um, if you make the transfer policies too restrictive, People are just going to lease their IP space. Uh, you're going to risk the integrity of both the Aaron registry and the IRR databases. Network operators are going to spend all day verifying LOAs, and uh, mass mayhem is going to break loose. Yeah, please. So I actually want to touch on two things. I'm going to say leases, and I'm going to say the word options. Okay. Ooh. And if if this doesn't cause you to get to get be afraid, be very afraid. Okay. Let's take the easy one. Options, Aaron. Two parties can go in a room and say, if and when you decide you're going to transfer your numbers, you're going to call me first, and I'm going to give you a sheep in exchange. And what? Uh, we don't. Yeah, that's to what two parties privately contract in the privacy of their own business. We try to stay away from. When they come to us with a transfer, we want it to be a valid transfer. We want the recipient to be able to meet the transfer policy. Um, I, I do know that there are people who are doing lockup agreements and things like that, and it's not Aaron's concern or, or thing. So that's one option that we've seen, which is 
rational, understandable. Um, I don't know what the risks involved in that are. I'll tell you, you have to think very hard about being on both sides of that arrangement. Now, let's talk about leases. Actually, in next, month, in next week's policy experience report, we are noting that we're seeing circumstances. This is at the Aaron meeting, and it'll be online for those of you who want to participate. We are seeing circumstances that could be related to the leasing of IP numbers. And because the contacts <coughs> in the Aaron database don't change, we need to understand, um, is that the community's expectation, okay? Um, it's true that um, that might be perfectly fine, according to the community, as long as those contacts work and they get to the right place. So if you pick up the phone and you try to reach someone for an abuse or technical contact, it actually gets the person holding the address. It may be considered quite unreasonable and that those should be considered instances of fraud. I actually don't know, but I will tell you it is true there is a correlation between parties that wish to use addresses, can't complete transfers, and the possibility of them leasing to one another. I, I do not know what the community's take on that is. I've heard from a broker about short-term leases. I can only think of one reason why someone would want to lease addresses for a short period of time. <laughs> Those addresses are less resellable afterwards. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> yeah. um, there are all kinds of parties that lease numbers. Um, and lease is an interesting term. Um, ISPs, from one perspective, lease right. numbers. Right. That's part um, of their service. It's part of their service. Right. I, is that a bad thing? No. Um, but if somebody enters the market with the sole purpose of leasing numbers, independent from any you know other services or things like that, would that be disruptive? Potentially. Um, but there are some very large leasing companies in the world. One's there. Um, so. You know, it's not necessarily a bad thing, um, but it is a market reality. Good. So this is my first uh, summit on the IPv6, so I'm kind of a newbie here. But uh, a couple of questions. One thing that was concerning to me is I understand you guys are kind of from different realms or whatnot, but one thing I learned is that there's IP spaces that are not being recorded. That's a concern, I think. Uh, whether they are 25 year old or whatnot, is there a process to clean that up? I want to understand that, number one. Number two, uh, question number two would be, if RIPE and APAC have already ran out and assignments are done for those guys, how did the, I would say, the dinosaur era, when, when it all came down to the final stages, how did that pan out? And would that have any reflection on how in the in the Aaron world in the U.S. North America North America how would that would that ref be reflective of how things could end up here? I'll take the first one. Recognize that some of the address block records are very old, and um, you know it's very hard to look at a company that existed in 1990. Three, four, five, six, seven, 1999, 2000, when there were. 2,000 ISPs all merging and forming and collapsing, or equipment vendors who went through an epic consolidation, um, sometimes those records don't get updated. Um, it's, there's, while we now send, do send reminders out to people, update their contacts, and I will say, to some extent, people are much better now about updating their records than ever before. We have this backlog out there, and I do not know how that backlog will get addressed. I will tell you that one encouraging thing by having a transfer market is that it gets cleaned up by the activities that happen through the transfer market, and so that's a good thing. Um, with respect to your second question, I just want to note that um, what's happening in APNIC and RIPE with the run out of the avail their available free pool. Um, in some cases is now showing up as demand in other regions of the globe under freshly formed U.S. companies, freshly formed companies in, in other regions, South America, Africa. And so that's not, I guess it's not necessarily a model we want to emulate and it's one that doesn't scale. <laughs> Um, yeah, uh, there's lots of number blocks out there that are inaccurately reflected in the registries today. That's a, that's a statement of fact. Is it getting better or is it getting worse? That's speculation. Nobody has a complete view and can answer that. I, I, nobody knows. 
Um, hopefully, it gets better um, because the records really are quite dated and quite inaccurate. Um, and that makes the registry information unreliable, and that's in no one's interest. So, you know, creating mechanisms where it can be updated, which are not um, unacceptable to a party, that's what I was talking about, an overarching commitment, you know. Um, so, for instance, there's policy things that could be done. Um, there's contractual things that Aaron could implement. There's, there's many things that could be done to help resolve that. But it has to start as a community, as you know, all the memberships, as the organizations that are involved, with a unified commitment to that objective. And then making sure that there's no unintended consequences in here of policies or contracts or, or you know, procedures which limit the ability to achieve that desired outcome. And today there's all of those. So there's lots of work to be done here can I answer the question on the, I thought it was a really interesting one on the uh, the different, the fact that RIPE and APNIC are down down to their like exhaust, their last eight that's, that's in runoff mode versus here and how that might uh, might or might not be analogous to what, we were, what, what Aaron might go through. What's interesting is we're not sure that it will be and, and um, uh, the the infrastructure over there and the, I'd say just the economies generally are just not, um, well, the internet and the uh, you know the size of the economies are smaller, not, not necessarily in RIPE, but certainly in, in APNIC, which is the first one to go in, in April 2011. And um, you know, for, for some of these smaller um, you know ISPs or hosting or managed hosting companies, you know, slash 22 is a, a huge amount of space, right? And I think what's going to I also would say that there a lot of those um, technology companies might there there's a lot of um, sort of me too where they sort of follow on best practice that's created here. And so I think that what, when, when Aaron runs out, it'll be more, I think it'll have a much uh, more, uh, I think it'll have a, a bigger impact. Um, and here's why I think um, because a lot of innovation comes from, uh, in technology comes from North America, um, I, and, and yet the people who are, I'd say are, um, a lot of the sort of the, the C-suite uh, of these companies are not really quite aware of what's of their IPv4, v6 transition policy because it's just not really, there's sort of a, it's not really, hasn't really reached their level, you know, and they're, they're looking at what their other competitors are doing in, you know, energy and uptime and uh, other facets and they're not really focused on this one yet. I think eventually there will be, a, you know, an acute problem. Like I'm not saying it'll be like a Hurricane Sandy or anything of this nature, but there will be something acute that will happen to some to a, a, a household technology name, um, you know, and it, may, it might occur after or before exhaustion. And I think at that point things will. I, I think um, that will be. Uh, I mean, I, you know, um, I think that at that point uh, things will get a lot more interesting in Aaron and transfer wise, and I think that will have. Uh, that will reverberate to, to, to ripen in AP Nick. Um, quick, quick market outlook. Uh, there is no market in Afrinic. There is no market in Lacnic. These uh, regions still have plenty of reserves from the RIR to allocate initial distributions. So there is no real market today. Um, unfortunately, there is no real market in the Aaron region either, and that's due to constraints. It's artificially constrained. And we've talked about that a lot. Um, Aaron um, is working towards a point where things will change, um, and APNIC got there early. Um, however, one of the factors that led to the skewing of the forecasts, those interesting lines of is it out <laughs> next year or out in 20 years, um, was the uh, process by which they were making distributions was extremely liberal. and companies and countries which were aware That's went right. out and ran the bank and they have strategic reserves which are going to last a long long time there are other entities which did not and they are feeling the pain now so the market in asia is spotty it right. depends on who you're dealing with and how much pain they're feeling but it is not a consistent picture within the region ripe ripe if you want a recent example is the quickest to adopt and employ markets. Um, there is a much bigger market going on in RIPE than there is in Aaron. 
Um, and that ought to be a puzzle to some people. But there are some things which are happening here on the market side of this which will change as people reach a point where the original source of number blocks no longer has them and they need to turn to a secondary market. I just want to comment that we actually, as I showed in my slide deck, we actually have quite a few transfers going on in the Aaron region, particularly in light of the fact that we're still allocating addresses to anyone who asks because we still have addresses available. While we do have a modest market and a number of facilitators set up who help work it, um, it does seem to suffice for those people who want to make use of it. Uh, in a region that's out of general availability like RIPE, it's expected that there's going to be more activity. Right. We have a question in front of uh, Yes. Um, IP, fee, IP version 4 has been around like 35 years. Mm -hmm. How long is, uh, do you think uh, IP version 6 is going to be around for? I, um, as much as I believe in science and technology, I don't intend to be around when IPv6 runs out. <laughs> Years ago, I, I did analysis of, of how, how liberal could we be with IPv6? How long could the address space possibly last? And I did something like, let's say every grocery, the, every UPC code had a unique slash 64, and it was scanned, and that slash 64 was gone forever. That was the kind of profligacy I was, I was working with. And the most I could come up with was about 200 years. In other words, it won't be numbers that dictate it. Yeah. There will be other factors which dictate a change of, you know, the communication protocol yeah. that's in use. Mm -hmm. Right. But also remember, if you take a pie and you <laughs> cut it into eight slices, you have eight slices. And it does not matter if the pie is a foot across or a mile across. So when we are giving out doing allocations of v6 <laughs> at the end of the day you have to remember you're giving out slices of a, pie, of a pie along whatever the prefix length is and um i s you you need to pay some attention to that because humans have a remarkable ability to follow things up <laughs> <laughs> all right we've got just a couple of minutes left here so in uh let's, we go down the list here and in in one minute or less what could happen? What, what could happen in the Aaron region to make the market better, right? So, and, and for for your value of better, right? So, so, in some cases that may mean a better who is accuracy. In some cases that may mean better address efficiency. But for your estimation of better, what needs to be done to make the market better? Um, remove the barriers that are keeping people from updating the registry would be the first, and I think the most important. Um, and that is something which Aaron can contribute to um, and your membership can contribute to. I think that is probably the most important thing that could be done. Um, there's other things which are secondary in nature but you know important but anything which works against the interest of maintaining and est well, establishing <laughs> and then maintaining an accurate registry that is badness and I would encourage all of you to get actively engaged in examining this and making sure that there are no artificial boundaries for people to get that done. Uh, for me to be, um, in order to enable organizations to make well-informed decisions about what their, their transition strategy is going to be, they need to know what the costs are going to be. And right now there is no transparency to price in the market. So some mechanism for seeing the prices of at least some transactions and you know, for a certain level. I just want to know what an address is costing and so that I can track how that's changing over time and then I can know what I'm getting into as I'm setting my strategy. I think uh, affording enterprises the ability to uh, be certain that they will be able to get what they think they need to grow and not just for two years but for longer than that um, is in the best interest of the community members. And I also think that it is, um, it, again, it, if, if, if we're really serious about IPv6, I think it, it lets them get a lot more comfortable with their migration strategy. Um, and, and so I think that you know, them being able to have comfort on, on uh, both their, their investment that they're making and their plan you know, beyond three months and two years is, um, is great, and I think that you know I don't. I think the community is is close. I think there are a couple of tweaks we can we can make to get it just a little bit better. 
I have to be a little careful here because I don't advocate for what the community should do. But the time is 4.55, and I'm going to agree with Chuck Lee on one aspect of what he said. Again, um, get involved. To the extent that this is an important community topic and, and we need to understand what the policy should be and why, okay? To some extent, we're, we're running on uh, policies that um, are based on very old historic documents. While the policies have been recently developed in the Aran region and the other regions, the fact of the matter is that I don't know if they've been discussed on such a wide scale as everyone who's affected on them. And so get involved, help understand what your concerns are, what your needs are one way or the other, um, and let's make sure that, that we can all enunciate why the policies are what they are. Maybe they're fine as is, maybe they need to change, but we should try to get over that hump and get certainty on this so that everyone has a predictable way going forward. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Let's the panel, please. Thank you.